Uh, there's a couple of things I just want to go over just before I get into um, uh, the topic of modesty this morning. I just want to make a brief comment on what's happening in the, the media these days and just with what we're hearing on the news in terms of North Carolina. You know, North Carolina, you know, they sort of tried to, with the whole transgenderism, tried to get, you know, people who think they're a girl, people who think they're a male to use the other restroom if they want. And then what happened in North Carolina, I believe, is they put a law in to say that, you know, only if, if you're born with the male genitalia can you use the male bathroom and only if you're born with the female genitalia can you use the female bathroom. So it makes sense to us that that should be in place. Um, but then obviously there was a lot of protesting and a lot of complaints from the homosexual movement to say, oh, it's a bigoted law, it's anti-LGBT. And I suppose it is anti-LGBT. I read as well, you know, uh, an article recently as well in Victoria. You know, supposedly Victoria and Melbourne is, uh, are considered like the progressive states of Australia. And, you know, the politicians in Victoria are sort of trying to lead the charge in saying that, you know, we're a progressive state, we want to, you know, be inclusive of homosexuals and, and push the, the marriage equality and all that sort of uh, nonsense. And uh, recently, I think they, they got approval to build what's called the, the Pride Centre in the Melbourne CBD, and it's actually funded by taxpayer dollars, and it's sort of like a homo museum. That's, that's what they're saying, you know, so it's got like you know, you go into a museum, you learn about like noble figures and about, you know, the, the issues that affect uh, things. So they're making it sort of like that. You go to this pride center and you'll learn about, you know, uh, like homosexual figures that they, they sort of lift up and the issues that they have. You can go there and get free health care and things like that with, you know, uh, you know, because the suicide rate's so high amongst transgender people and all these sorts of things. So this is what's sort of happening in the news right now, just this, this push for the homosexual agenda. And, you know, obviously I'm as annoyed as anybody else is by the homosexual agenda. But I wanted to sort of turn our focus away in the sense of, you know, we, we look at them and we, we think, you know, has the world gone insane? And obviously, to, from our point of view, the world has gone insane. You know, we're, we're even discussing which bathroom people should use and, and sort of detaching gender identity from actually the, the biological parts that you were born with. Um, but I just wanted to give you this thought this morning. This is from Matthew 5.13. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now this is a very famous verse. We know, you know, as Christians, we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. You know, and we look at things that are happening in the political spectrum. We look at things that are happening in the world. And we think, you know, has the world gone insane? And I mean, obviously they have. But when you think of the question, you know, why is the world getting so dark? Why is the world getting so flavorless? Oh, well, it's because Christians are not being salt and light. Because, you know, food, if you add salt to food, that food's going to get salty. You know, if you add light to a dark room, that room will get light. So the reason why the food is flavorless is because there's no salt. You know, the reason why a room is dark is because there's no light. Right? So we have to, you know, stop sort of pointing the blame. And it, this sort of goes into the whole theme of, you know, what can we change? You know, we can't change the homosexual. You know, the homosexual is going to go and push their agenda and cram it down everyone's throat. But we can't change what we're going to do. Amen. We can change how bright we shine. We can change how salty we are. So has the world gone insane or are we just losing the spiritual battle? You know, we're just seeing the symptoms of a battle that's being like, I mean, they can't win the war. We know that the war is going to be won by Jesus Christ when he comes again. But we, are, I believe, we're just seeing these things happen because we're losing the spiritual battle. And we're losing the spiritual battle because if you think about it, you know, you know the, the, the homosexual activists, you know, whether they are homosexual themselves or not, I mean, how are they spending their weekends? You know, they're probably making phone calls, volunteering at homosexual organizations. How are Christians spending their weekends? Going to the movies, you know, serving themselves. You know, what, how, how, how are the homosexuals, how are they spending their money? 
I'm sure they pour thousands of dollars into these organizations and, and, you, know, and uh, you know, promoting their political agendas. How do Christians spend their money? So instead of us looking at the, hey, I'm just as annoyed as you are at what's going on in the world, but we've got to shift our focus back to where the real cause of the issue is. And it's God's people. You know, because we're too busy amongst the thorns. We're too busy spending our lives serving ourselves. You know, but they're not. You know, they, they spend their weekends soul damning, right? But then how are Christians spending their weekends? You know, do we spend our weekends soul winning? Do we spend our spare time soul winning? You know, how are we spending our money? So I just wanted to give you that thought this morning because obviously we see what's happening and it's annoying. Yeah, it's, and, it, and we think oh, the world's going crazy. But what is the real reason why it's like that? Um, now, last sermon I preached about nakedness. So, I guess on that topic, let's read Leviticus 20. I just wanted to cover a couple of things, just clarify a few points from my last sermon that I didn't feel I really explained that well. Um, the first one was, you know, when I made the point about uncovering somebody's nakedness and saying, you know, I don't believe it's a sin necessarily to uncover somebody's nakedness. And that's, I don't think, uh, sorry, Leviticus 18. I'll go just go there. It's a bit clearer. I don't think Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 are just talking about not looking at somebody's nakedness. It's actually talking about the physical sleeping together. Um, but let's just read a couple of verses here. It says here in verse 6, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter, of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife, she is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law, she is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover na the nakedness of thy brother's wife, it is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter uh, or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart from her uncleanness. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto, it is confusion. And I'll just read up to there. So you can see here that there's a lot of statements here made not to uncover your near of kin's nakedness. And somebody might take this passage, and this is a point I was trying to, make, trying to make. Somebody might take this passage and say, see, there you go. It's not right to see another person's nakedness. But is this what this passage is talking about? See, if this passage is only talking about looking at somebody's nakedness, then why does it only talk about near of kin? We see here in verse 6, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him, to uncover their nakedness. So specifically when it goes through the uncovering of the nakedness, it's talking about uh, nearer of kin. So if, if this is just talking about looking at somebody's nakedness, it only mentions near of kin. So therefore, if you were to extend the law to say, well, you can't look at anybody's nakedness, that would need to be assumed. You'd need to say, well, it only mentions near of kin, but we're extending the application to far of kin as well. Now, if this verse, you're assuming that it doesn't only apply to near of kin, it, only apply, it also applies to far of kin, then can you take the interpretation now that this is actually talking about sleeping with people, actually intercourse? Because obviously it's saying here that you shouldn't sleep with near of kin, 
but anybody we marry ought to be far of kin, right? So we can't assume both. We can't say, no, it's only talking about looking and also assume that it's talking about far of kin, but also take this passage to mean it's talking about intercourse and, and it also uh, be talking about far of kin. So that's what I mean. Like, you can't have it both. If it, if it doesn't include far of kin and it's only looking, then how can you make it also mean simultaneously it's about intercourse and excludes far of kin? So... That's what I mean by you can't hold both interpretations of this passage uh, simultaneously. Um, and if you say, well, it's, it's referring to intercourse and it doesn't include far of kin, does that mean you only can't look at near of kin, but you can look at far of kin? You know what I mean? Like it just, it just can't make it sort of uh, fit both ways. So that was the point I was trying to make with this passage. I just feel like I didn't explain it that, that well. Um, the other one I just wanted to cover because some, some points came up last week, so I just wanted to go over this again just to sort of clarify it. But about the thighs being nakedness. And, you know, I, I feel that Exodus 28, 42 really is the key passage because this is where you would determine that thighs are nakedness if you took the interpretation that some people would to say that thighs and loins are included in the nakedness being defined here. Um, to the Isaiah passage, which talks about the lady uncovering her locks, making bare the leg, passing over the rivers, uncovering the thigh. Because um, you'd need to start with this to say, okay, the thigh is nakedness, and therefore in the Isaiah verse, um, you would only take the thigh as saying that her nakedness is being uncovered. So I feel like this is really the key verse. I don't think there's a, really another verse to make the case that thighs are nakedness. I think it would all stem from this verse. So Exodus 28, 42. Let's just read that. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. Now, one thing I just want to point out first of all is in Exodus 28, 42, it's not actually defining what nakedness is. I know you think that the plain reading of this passage, it's not actually telling you what nakedness is. All it's, all, what this verse is actually about, it's giving direction to Moses and to the people building the tabernacle and building all the clothes, the length of these linen breeches. Right? Because it doesn't say, and thou shalt make them linen, linen breeches to cover their nakedness, even the loins and the thighs. Because if it was to say that, then you can say, ah, there you go. Nakedness is defined as loins and thighs. Like it says in the Isaiah passage where, remember when Isaiah preached naked, it says, you know, they'll see your nakedness, even the buttocks will be uncovered. Right? So I believe that's a much clearer verse to say that, hey, nakedness and buttocks, buttocks are actually being defined as nakedness in that passage. But in this passage, I mean, the plain reading of this passage, it's not even defining what nakedness is. All it's saying is the linen breeches are going to cover the nakedness and the linen breeches are going to go from the loins to the thighs. So it's not actually saying nakedness is loins and thighs. It's saying nakedness is going to be covered and the breeches, you need to make them so that they go from the loins to the thighs. Now, the argument would be that because... The argument for loins and thighs being nakedness would say, well, because there is nothing between loins and thighs, it wouldn't make sense because if it's covering something between the loins and thighs, but the loins and thighs are connected, then you're not actually wearing anything. Whereas we would say, well, I would say that there is something between the loins and the thighs. It's your nakedness, which is what the linen breeches are covering. So what I sort of thought about was, well, actually, the, 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 the dispute is really on what the definition of loins is. Because if loins are your genitals, then people will say, like, well, you're not half covering your genitals, so therefore it's all covered. And if you're covering from your loins to your thighs, then why would you cover only one and not the other if only one is considered nakedness? So I thought, well, let's, well, let's look at what, what, what loins is actually is. Because I, I always assumed that loins were the waist. But other people think that loins are, you know, the, the, the front part of your genitals and, and the back part is your buttocks. So I actually looked up on dictionary.com what the, um, uh, the definition was. So it gives a couple of different definitions. So the first one, it says here, usually loins, and, you know, I don't think this would really be the basis of how we determine truth, but sometimes going to a dictionary is helpful. So it says here, usually loins, the part or parts of the human body of a quadruped, Oh, sorry, the part or parts of the human body or of a quadruped animal, so that's an animal that work, walks on all fours, on either side of the spinal column between the false ribs. So your false ribs are your lowest ribs and the hip bone. So the very first definition of loins is this area of your body. 
Second definition, a cut of meat from this region of the animal, especially a portion including the vertebrae of such parts. So it's like when you go to the shops and you buy a, the loin cut, right? It's, it's, the, it's the meat that comes from that area that's defined as the loins. Now, the third definition of loins, I mean, it's it divided into two here. The part of the body between the hips and the lower ribs, especially regarded as the seat of physical strength and generative power. So that's interesting that it's saying it's not only this area, but it's also used like euphemistically to to talk about a, a person's strength in their loins. Um, and that's where you get the euphemism, like the fruit of your loins or the children of your loins, um, because it's also regarded as the, uh, the sort of the seat of generative power where, you, uh, where a person uh, can uh, beget children. And then B, the second, def the second definition in number three is the genital and pubic area genitalia. And it talks about some uh, idioms. I think it's interesting here that when it looks at the origin of the word, it comes from some Latin word, lum. So if you think of a lumbar support on a chair, you're not supporting your genitals. Like a lumbar support is not something that's on the seat of the, <laughs> you know, like a bicycle seat on your chair. You know, the, the, the lumbar support is something that supports your back, this area, right, and your lower back. So there's a couple of definitions, but notice that, you know, because uh, Gersh and I were talking about this and we were saying like, well, is loins this? Or is loins your genitals, or is it both? But there's actually no there's actually no definition here that includes both, because you know when you when you look at a word in a dictionary and there's like three different meanings, you don't say it's either one or the second or the third. You don't say oh it's two and three simultaneously. Do you know what I mean? You don't say it's all three definitions simultaneously. So there isn't actually a dictionary definition that says loins includes both this area and the hips and the groin and your genitals. There is one definition later on in, in the British version I saw here. It says here, the hips and the inner surface of the legs where, where they join the trunk of the body, which is the crotch. So your crotch is not actually your genitals. Your crotch, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm pointing there. But you know, like your, your crotch is, you know, that, that area on either side. Uh, it's not actually the genitals, which I believe is what uh, the Bible defines as nakedness. So my point is there is no definition which just says it's all that area but it's like one or the other. So it, you know, it could be genitals or it could be this, this area. Now, if, if we take, uh, if we just stop there, I would say that you know, the first definition supports my view, which is there is something between the loins and the thighs. The loins is here, the thighs are down here, you're covering your nakedness. That makes sense if the linen breeches go from your loins to your thighs. So I think that already weakens the argument that there is nothing between the loins and the thighs and therefore loins are nakedness because the primary definition is it's here. So whilst I don't think that totally destroys the other argument, the point I'm trying to make is if somebody's going to be dogmatic using Exodus 28:42 to say, thus saith the Lord, you know, thighs are nakedness, I'm just sort of making the point to you that that argument is not as strong as you think it is. You know, that that verse, first of all, is not actually defining nakedness. There is, there could be something between the loins and the thighs, um, and it's not actually saying what nakedness is. Now, let's look at a couple of verses in the Bible, because I think if we see the way it's actually used in the Bible, I think it makes a stronger case for the fact that loins are here and, and not your genitals. Now, I do acknowledge that the Bible does use the euphemism of, you know, the, the fruit of your loins. Let me show you some here. Hebrews 7.10, talking about, you know, the tithes here, saying that Abraham paid tithes in, in Melchizedek. In verse 9 it says, And I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paith tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now you might say, well, you know, obviously from, you know, from your genitals is where you know, the man's seed comes from. But then this could also be referring to that first definition where the loins is the seat of generative power. And it's just using the euphemism because Levi was not actually in Abraham, you know what I mean? Like the seed was there. It's just saying that he was not yet born um, before Abraham paid tithes in Melchizedek. Um, again here in Acts 2.30. This is talking about David. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So again, I think I, that phrase is used euphemistically. It's not actually saying that like men give birth to children and it comes out of their genitals. Um, and I'll just show you here, because look at this. Um, Genesis 15. 
because this is this is another phrase that he used talking about men bringing forth children it says here look and the, behold the word of the lord came unto him saying this shall not be thine heir but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir so you know your bowels have nothing to do with reproduction but it's a euphemism right to say you know it's, it's talking probably about that definition to say it's like your seat of generative power or your strength you know bowels you know you have bowels of compassion you know, but it's not like it's not like your bowels actually have any, you know, compassion in there. It's a, it's a, it's a euphemism. Um, so let me show you some verses from the Bible in regards to loins that I think support the fact that loins are up here. Second uh, Kings. So this is about Elijah. It says, and they answered him, he was an hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So again, like girding up your loins, a girdle about your loins. I mean, most of us would think of this as a belt, like, you know, girt about with truth, like the belt of truth holding your pants up. Um, so, I mean, can loins mean genitals in this passage? I mean, that's, it'd be kind of weird if like he's met Elijah and he's girt with leather about his loins and it's like on his genitals. So that, that, that wouldn't make sense. Um, look at this verse here. This is Job talking about behemoth. It says, Lo, and I think this is a pretty good verse that sort of defines loins. It says, Lo, now his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. So your navel is your belly button. So it's, 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 I think it's sort of restating the same thing. Like your strength is here and his force, his strength is in the navel of his belly. Um, Isaiah 21, 3. Look at this one. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I, bow, I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. So when you read that, it, it compares the pain in his loins, comparing it to the pangs of a woman in birth. Now, when a woman's travailing in birth, she's not like, oh, like, on a, like a guy that's just been hitting the groin, right? Like, she's like this. She's like, oh, because this is where the contractions are happening. So, again, I think, you know, it's referring to the loins are up, this upper area up here. Um, there's another verse like this in Jeremiah. It says, Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. So you can imagine something like this, right? Like, like a man travailing in pain, like a woman uh, in childbirth, <coughs> not a man with his um, hands on his groin. Um, this is an interesting one. I'm going to show you this. Ezekiel 8, 2. <laughs> it's another one with loins. It says, then I beheld. So Ezekiel, I believe, gets this vision of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that's what I think it is. Then he says, then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins, even downward, fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. So he sees this figure, and from the loins downward, it's fire, and from the loins upward, it's, it's amber. Now, I think this is interesting because, you know, Exodus 28, 42 talks about from the loins even to the thighs. And people will say, well, it says from, it must include it. But then think about this. If this, if this figure is there, and from the loins upward, from the loins downward, he's fire, but the loins upward is amber. Then obviously the loins must be like a singular reference point, right? Because how can he, how can the loins be fire and amber at the same time if it's saying from the loins upward, including the loins? Because that would mean that let's say your loins are here, your loins are fire, but then your loins are also amber from the other side of your loins. So obviously it, the Bible can use this phrase to say from your loins upward and from your loins downward, meaning like at that point. So. My point is here, it uses sort of the same words of from the loins, you know, from the loins even to the thighs of shall, they shall reach. Doesn't necessarily mean it's covering the whole loins. Does that make sense? Because then how can you say from this point downwards and this point upwards? Because then there'd be a region that is both fire and amber. Does that make sense? So anyways, um, so my point is, you know, I, I don't know whether I can like absolutely destroy the other, the other side, but all I'm saying is I think there's a very strong case 
that the right interpretation of Exodus 28, 42 is has nothing to do with telling you what nakedness is, that it's talking about the garment. And there's a strong case to say that loins don't include the genitals. And if you wear a garment from the loins to the thighs, it'll cover something. There is something between there. Um, and therefore, I don't know whether somebody can dogmatically just state that thighs are nakedness based on that verse. So I hope that clarifies that a bit. I hope that gives you a bit more clarity there. I know that's um, one important point to sort of stress. Um, okay, let's go to let's go on to modesty today. Hopefully, I haven't taken too much time there. Okay, so now when it comes to modesty, you know, there's not actually really much said in the Bible about modesty. You know, there's the word um, moderation in one verse in Philippians. There's the word moderately used in uh, I think Jeremiah somewhere. Can't remember. And then there's modest, which is the passage that most of us would think about when we think about how to dress and clothing in 1 Timothy 2. And this is it. That actually uses the word modesty. I think there's more said giving us principles about modesty. And that's really what I want to talk about over the next couple of weeks, depending on how long I take to preach this. But just principles in regard to clothing. Because, you know, yeah, you can preach just one sermon on modesty, but Modesty isn't the only way we determine how we dress. So if we're going to talk about clothing and about dress, modesty is just one principle that we apply when we're thinking about how we should dress. 1 Timothy 2.9 In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or goals or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, there's a similar passage in 1 Peter. It says here, Likewi Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on an apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye, as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So we have two passages here alluding to how Christian women ought to dress. Now, before I get into you know, what it's actually addressing in these two verses and some thoughts behind them, I just want to address the topic of you know, men and modesty. Because when we read these two verses, obviously they're directed at women. They're not directed at men. Because it's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not a masculine attribute to be overly concerned about your appearance. You know, it's a feminine attribute to want to be beautiful, to want to do up your hair, to want to be noticed and be attractive. It's not a masculine attribute. Um, uh, attribute. So I think a man that is overly concerned about his appearance is being girly. You know, it's, it's a girly thing to do. Like you, you care, like you want to look beautiful, you want to beautify yourself. Now that doesn't mean that a man should not be concerned about his appearance at all. But you know, it's like there's a difference between you know being neatly presented, right? You want you want to be clean cut because you've got a job interview, or you want to you don't want to look like a like a, like a like a shame, right? Um, to, to like, you know, people that, you know, carry a comb with them and they're just constantly like doing their hair and they're obsessed with their hair. You know, there's, there's a difference obviously between staying in shape and wanting to be fit and, you know, wanting to be like the next Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? And just obsessing. You know, you see, I remember like when, when I used to go to the gym with my friends and you see those guys in front of the mirror and they're just like, yeah, like looking. I mean, there's a difference between just wanting to stay in shape and, and being obsessed with your figure and your, and your body image. You know, um, you know, wanting to be presentable, how you dress and, you know, dressing to your mood, you know, and like just having an outfit for you know, every day of the week or whatever. Right. Um, there's a difference. You know, it's like having having decent shoes for the task. You know, I'm all for quality. Right. Like having decent shoes to do. You know, we play futsal. You know, I bought some futsal shoes. But 
I'm not gonna like have shoes for just different days of the week. You know, I feel like green today, so I've got my green shoes. I feel like red today, I've got my red shoes. You know, shoes to match different outfits. I always felt that guys that obsessed about shoes were just so girly, you know, like, and then they'd have their, like, their shoes all displayed at home, like, you know, which one are they gonna wear today? Like, if you take more than two minutes to decide, or not even that, if you take more than five seconds to decide what shoes you're gonna put on, you've got too many shoes as a guy, right? Like, man, a girl, like, it's a bit different, right? Because girl, girls are girls and there's a place for girls to want to doll up a bit. Um, but not guys. I always felt that guys that obsessed about shoes, they were just so girly. You know, they'd go to those, those shoe shops and, you know, that's why, like, you know, I went to Alex's place, Alex's shop to buy a bunch, uh, like, some soccer shoes. I can't even just buy, like, a plain pair of soccer shoes because girl, guys are so girly these days that the soccer shoes need to be bright pink, bright green, bright orange. Can I just get a black and white pair of soccer shoes these days? <laughs> I, so it's just things like that, like our, our, our culture has become so feminized that you can't even go and buy a plain pair of indoor soccer shoes these days that come in your size because everyone's buying all these girly stuff. Um, you know, like when it, in 2009, um, you know, I decided to shave my head. And it wasn't because I was trying to be Steven Anderson or anything. Like, to, to be honest, the reason why I shaved my head is because I just could not be bothered doing my hair in the morning anymore. I, I just, year after year, you know, waking up with bed hair and trying to get it straight and putting gel in it and all that sort of stuff. And in 2009, I just decided, you know, I'm just sick of like dealing with my hair. I'm just going to shave it off. And if I look weird, people are just going to have to deal with it. Um, so then I, 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 did the, I did the crew cut and people were like, whoa, at first, like they thought I was a monk and everything like that. But then now they just think, oh, that's just Victor. Victor just has hair like that. And then like, great. So I just felt like, oh man, my haircut, it just, it just freed me from the shackles of vanity. You know, because I just didn't, I can wake up in the morning, have to worry, don't even, it's not even give it a thought, it's just you wake up, it's perfect, it's done. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I think we should be like as men, like we shouldn't be overly concerned. Yes, you want to be presentable, you want to dress for the occasion, but, you know, there's a difference between, you know, just dressing for the occasion and just obsessing over um, things like that. You know, that's why I love uniforms. I love like, work, so at work when it has a uniform. My work doesn't, but then I just end up wearing a Staples shirt because I probably shouldn't say that to say where I work. But you know, I end up wearing like, you know, the, the Staples shirt because I just want to be able to wear the same thing every day. That's why I love uniforms. You don't have to th I don't have to think about what shirt to wear, whether it matches with my tie. I can just wear the same thing every day. And um, nobody bats an eye at work. <coughs> So when it comes in regards to men and modesty, you know, that's why the Bible, it talks about the wives. It talks about the girls because this is not something that should be directed at guys. And, you know, that's why when, when, when a guy hears a sermon on modesty and he's like convicted in his heart, it's because you're, you're being too girly. <laughs> You know, like, because it's not, it's, it's not directed at you. Like, when it comes to you, it's about, like, being, you know, confident and loving your, your husband. You know, love, stuff, loving your husband. Loving your wife. You know, being, being manly. You know, that is not about modesty and your, and your appearance. It's just about, you know, not having long hair, not being ashamed, um, things like that. So, when it comes to modesty, I think there are three aspects to modesty, which I'll cover. Um, the first one is... Wearing clothes that draw attention to themselves. So, you know, because what, what does modesty mean? Modesty means that you're not drawing attention to yourself. You're very you're modest. So, three aspects, I think, to modesty. First one is wearing clothes that are immodest. So, wearing clothes that draw attention to themselves. And I'm just going to go through the principles this week. I'm not going to mention so much for specifics because I want to do that next week. So first of all, clothes that draw attention to themselves. We see in 1 Timothy 2, it says here in verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. So what is sobriety? So sobriety is when you're being serious. You're sober. You're clear. You know, when you put on your clothes, you're doing it with a clear mind. You're thinking about what you're actually wearing. Um, and you're serious about it. So... You know, when I guess when it comes to, you know, you see men these days, sometimes they, they you know, they, they, you know, I just did the, at work this photo shoot with this photographer and, it, and his pants were like those hipster pants and then his shirt was like this tight shirt and every time like he would bend down to like move the, the things that he was taking photos of, yeah, you can see his undies, you can see his, his butt crack and I'm just thinking like, did this guy think about like what he actually wore that day? You know, was he being sober like thinking, okay, I'm putting on pants 
My pants is meant to be like covering my body. And then every time I bend over, I could people can just see everything anyway. So did you really sort of think through what you were going to wear that day? Um, you know, so we ought to think through and be sober about what we wear. So men, you know, they have to pull their pants up. You know, like why why wear a hat and then wear it crooked? To me, that's just silly. But um, that seems to be the fashion these days. You know, they wear a crooked. You know, just straighten the hat. You know, wear your pants properly. But when it comes to girls, you know, maybe not so much the girls that, that sort of uh, in Australia, but I find, uh, you know, amongst the Asian culture when I was at high school and things, you know, girls would just dress in these crazy hairdos and, and, and weird outfits that they look like a cartoon character. You know, like they're wearing overalls like Mickey Mouse. You know, they're, 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 they've got like the colored hair like anime characters and, you know, the fancy hairdos. Even guys will have like the fancy hairdos. They want to look like, you know, like the ninjas on Naruto. Um, so it's sober. You know, I think when somebody looks at you, how you dress, they shouldn't think, you know, you're a cartoon character. You know, are you trying to look like an anime character? Like, you should, they should think that you're trying to be serious in the way you dress. Um, f let's go back to 1 Peter 3. <clears throat> look at verse 4. It says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So one principle we can glean from there is, you know, a woman ought to be meek and quiet, you know, humble, quiet. So don't you think her clothing should also give that appearance? You know, we, we hear about people, they wear clothes and you'll say something like, oh, that's a really loud outfit. You know, I don't think that's the sort of impression people should get when they look at a, how a Christian woman dresses. You know, saying, well, that's a really loud outfit. That, that's like, you know, saying a lot of things, it's making a bold statement. You know, it, it ought to be this spirit of a meek and quiet spirit. I think this is how we ought to dress as well. Clothes that don't, that are not loud, that don't draw attention to themselves. Um, you know, we see here that, you know, wives ought to be in subjection. It says here in verse 5, you know, being in, in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well. And are not afraid with any amazement. So I see here, you know, sobriety, um, clothing that is meek and quiet. I, I mean, clothing that is submissive. I, I don't even know, I'm not, so I'm not going to really get into specifics because the Bible doesn't say specifics, but when somebody looks at your clothing, do, do they see like a rebellious teenage girl? Or do they see a modest Christian woman? You know what I mean? So uh, this is the things you've got to think of, you know, rebellious attitude. You know, do, do, do you dress just to look different? You know, just to be different, just to rebel. Or, you know, are you wearing something that you know your husband or you know your father won't like, but you wear it anyway? You know, this rebellious attitude in how you dress. Now, one thing I want to say here in terms of clothes that draw attention to themselves, I do not believe that these passages are teaching that it is always wrong to wear what is mentioned in these verses. And I'll explain in a second. I believe it's talking about your lifestyle. Like when it talks about, like the Bible talks about moderation. The Bible talks about modesty here. But that doesn't mean there isn't a time for wearing of gold and putting on costly hair, costly array and doing up your hair. I believe it's talking about your lifestyle in general. If you see here in 1 Peter 3, the, converse, the, the, the um, context here is the conversation of the wives. I mean, it's a husband looking at his wife's life in general. <laughs> Ought to be modest, or not to be the adorning of the outward. Um, we see in uh, 2 Timothy 2, the context of this passage is how we appear to the world. Um, see, look here, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may, we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, why do I say that? It can't be a sin to put on gold and jewels and costly array. Um, I'll explain why. Because I believe that there are situations where, I guess, what would be deemed as immodest clothes, if you were to wear them every day, are not necessarily sinful. Um, let me give you two examples from the Bible. So in Exodus 28.2. So I'm just trying to build a sound position here. So Exodus 28. You remember when the garments were made for the priests? I mean, these garments were expensive garments made of blue, you know, scarlet or whatever, and, and the jewels that would be on it. And look at what it says here. It says, And thou shalt make, and thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, 
for glory and for beauty. So these garments were specifically made to be worn by the priest for glory and for beauty, to be admired, to be looked at. Um, so, so I guess if you were to wear these every day, it would be immodest. But it's made for a specific purpose and therefore it's modest. So if you think about what makes clothes modest and immodest, I guess it's about suiting the occasion. You know, it's like if you went to a funeral and you wear bright red. I mean, that's immodest at the funeral. But if you're at like a, a, a dress-up party, hey, bright red, it's modest because it's, it's expected. So it's about what's expected. I mean, modesty is a subjective term and that's why you can't just say, oh, gold is immodest because there is a time to wear gold. Or you say like costly array is immodest. But there's a time where costly array is suitable um, and it's about wearing things that are suitable for the occasion and what's expected. There's another passage in verse Exodus 28, 40 that says the same thing, but I'll go on. Uh, look here, Revelation 21, 2. Talks about the new city, but look at what it compares the new city to. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now generally when you have a wedding, a bride is adorned with jewels, with costly array. She might have broidered hair, but is she sinning? No, right? She can't be if God is saying, well, he's, he's adorning it. But I mean, uh, I'll show you this verse in Isaiah 61.10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. So he's saying here that God is clothing him like a bride and groom adorn themselves for their wedding day. And the bride is being adorned with jewels. And jewels include gold, because I believe there's a verse in the Bible that says like a, a jewel of gold in a peak snout. This is like a woman without discretion. So even like say a ring, according to the Bible, I think would be considered like a jewel, not just, uh, you know, stones. But my point is, you know, why is this okay? Because it's not, you're not getting married every day. Like if, if how you dress at your wedding is how you dress every day, then you're being immodest because that's ought not to be your life. You know, but there are times where quote unquote immodest clothing is modest because it suits the occasion. Like a wedding, like the priests were decked. Um, and you're not being immodest. There's these one time things where it is suitable. You know, other possible scenarios might be like a fancy dress party, right? You know, people go, they go to a themed party. I remember on my 18th birthday party, um, or was it my 21st? I can't remember now. We had like a Bible themed birthday, you know, and then, you know, people came like dressed as like kings and queens. And I remember my brother and I and these other couple of other guys, we all came as Roman soldiers. So we were like in these little skirts. And like, it was funny because we were like standing outside like the, 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 the function room and it was like you know, it's Roman soldiers like security cards and then we were like we were like playing on the on the bridge like just like having spas and like taking photos and stuff so you know that's a, you know that might be like a similar scenario right where it's like a one occasion where it's you're not being immodest because it's expected that you're wearing clothes that are you know gonna be fun and draw attention to yourself but everyone's doing that you know because it's a fancy dress party what about like a protest or a public demonstration you know, you might be wearing something to try and get the public's attention, holding signs, drawing attention to yourself. And you say, well, you shouldn't do that because you're being immodest. No, because it's, that's expected at a protest. You're trying to preach a message, right? You're trying to tell people um, what, a, what, you're, what you're trying to get out, a message you're trying to share. So that's number one. You know, wearing clothes that are modest, and they're modest in and of themselves, meaning they don't draw attention to themselves. But I do think there's that exception that there are certain events or certain things where what would normally be immodest are modest, like weddings and things like that. But if that's just how you're dressing every day, then I think uh, you might want to think about how you're dressing. Now, the second thing is, let's go back to 1 Timothy 2. Second point is uh, clothes that draw attention to your wealth. Right? So you've got clothes that draw attention to the clothes themselves. But then you have clothes that draw attention to your wealth and you know, how financially well off you are. Um, look at what it says here in verse 9. Uh, it says, Not with broidered hair or, go or gold or pearls or costly array. Now let's just talk about broidered hair first of all. Broidered hair is, I believe, 
you know, when they have all their patterns in their hand, they, they braid it and, and you know, you so, see some videos on YouTube, sometimes they appear in your feed, like those, uh, those uh, recipe videos where they like do off a lady's hair, and like, oh, they can do all sorts of things with people's hair. But it probably took a long time to do. I mean, you're watching that video in like 10 seconds of, or 30 seconds of how they do this lady's hair, but it probably took them hours to do that. So, you know, this is, people that have broided hair, if they're doing this every day, I mean, these are obviously people with a lot of time on their hands. You know, if you're paying somebody to do that, that costs a lot of money. You know, so I think this is about somebody, you know, sort of showing off their wealth, right? Showing off that they've got this fancy hair, all these jewelry, the expensive clothes. You know, I was, I was shocked. You know, I was dating a girl once. I was just shocked to find out how much girls spend on their hair. I had no idea like how much hairdressers charge. And I remember she went to get her hair straightened and then she was getting quotes at like different hairdressers. I was like, how much are they quoting you? And it was like five, six hundred dollars. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I, I thought that Asian girls with straight hair, like I thought just that's just how it was, you know, like they just, <laughs> they just comb it and then it's like straight. Cause like when I, when I, my hair was straight like that. I didn't realize they paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars with all these chemicals in it to straighten it. Uh, and I just had no idea how much money women spend on their hair. Um, and that's why, like, the hair is mentioned here, because you can spend, you can pile a lot of money uh, into, into your hair, a lot of time. Um, you know, curling it, straightening it, and then recurling it again, you know? Because, <laughs> <'cause>, you know, <laughs> you didn't like, now that it's curled, you want it straight again. It's straight, you want it curled. It's like every season you're changing, spending $500 each time. Just, just have the hair you want, and you can just save all that money. Um, you know, and colouring it as well, and you're colouring, you're destroying your hair every time you bleach it and colour it and things like that. You sp all that money that you're spending all on your hair, um, you know, it's a waste of money. Um, and is it, is it a way that people show off their wealth? It could be. You know, I'm not saying everyone that does it is um, necessarily showing off their wealth, but that's what we're sort of talking about now, is like ways that people can show off their wealth. You know, it says here about costly array. So you've got your jewellery, obviously, that's, that's very expensive and your costly array. So clothes, that are expensive. And you know, like I was saying before, you know, I'm all for quality. If something is, you know, gonna break on you or, you know, you put it in the wash once and it's no longer wearable. I mean, that's where you wanna spend some money, right? On quality, because you're actually doing the cheaper thing. If you buy one thing once and it lasts you longer, that's better than just buying it again and again and again. But you know, let's face it, sometimes there are things where the branded item does the same thing as the non-branded item and people just want the branded item because they want people to see that they've got the branded item. Um, I was talking with somebody recently and you know, they were going to go buy some pajamas but instead of, you know, pajamas, I mean, nobody's even looking at them, right? You can, go to, you can go to Kmart, buy like $5 pair of pants, you know, $5 t-shirt, there you go, you got pajamas. But people want to buy like the Peter Alexander pajamas and spend like $80, $100 on a pair of pajamas. And like, and the pajamas are like so flimsy that like, they, I remember my friend bought me a pair of Peter Alexander pajamas for my birthday and then they just like tear so easily because they're just so, so, so like weak and soft and comfortable. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, you know, like you don't have to spend all this money on expensive pajamas or, you know, like I, got, like I think, like for example, the handbag. You know, women spend like, like, how much is an LV handbag? It's like $1,500, $2,000. I mean, isn't it just do the same job as, the, as a Kmart handbag? I mean, you're just putting stuff in the bag and just carrying things around. So, you know, just think about how you spend your money. And even like what I talked about this morning, like how are Christians spending your money? You know, you're just spending your money just, you know, buttering yourself up. You know, where that money could be used to, to, to serve God, um, to do things for the kingdom of God. So called the costly array, um, Philippians 4, 5. I think this verse is very interesting. Um, I won't go into all the points I wanted to say about this verse, but look at what it says here. It says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, what's such an interesting verse about it is it's like an oxymoron, you know, because it's saying what you want to be known of you is the fact that you don't want to be known, like your moderation. You know, so it's like most people in the world, when they want to be noticed, it's their extravagance, isn't it? It's like about their fancy clothes, their fancy cars, the fancy building, the fanciness, right? But God is saying here, let your moderation be known unto all men. So how a Christian ought to be known is how moderate they are and how self-controlled they are and how much they don't really want to be noticed. That's what 
they should be noticed for. Isn't that weird? It's like it's sort of like an oxymoron. Um, the Lord is at hand. I won't sort of go, go into this, but there's this theme throughout the Bible. I'll just show you one verse in First Pe uh, Second Peter. It says here. It says the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holiness, holy conversation, and godliness? So this passage is saying here that one day Jesus is going to come back, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. Everything's going to be burned up. So it's saying, so what sort of person should you be? How should you live your life? How should you spend your resources? How should you spend your time? How should you spend your money? And that's really what we see here in Philippians 4.5. It's saying, let your moderation be known unto all men. How are you going to live? Are you living moderately? Because the Lord is at hand. Because one day it's all going to go. Right? So how, how are you living your life? Now, that's why I'll say, like moderation means that our life should be characterized by moderation. But I don't think it means that there are not times of immoderation. Do you know what I mean? Because let's say if you're, if you're, mod if you're living in modesty, in moderation, it doesn't mean that you're just constantly at medium. It just means that you're in moderation, meaning there are times when there's ups, there's times when there's down, but on, on average, it's moderate. Because there w I think there will be times where you will do things of extravagance. Like, like we talked about with the clothing. There are times where you'll dress up, you know, for the wedding or whatever. And that could be like that. You know, you're generally a person that's quite tame. You, you're very frugal. But then you have a celebration, like a wedding or an anniversary or a, a, a milestone birthday, where you do want to do something a bit more extravagant and, ex and celebrate and throw a party. And I don't think that's wrong, because obviously even God, He's going to throw the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's got to do some things that are extravagant. Um, but it's not how we ought to be known unto all men. Our moderation ought to make us known unto all men. So there are things, I think, where... There are times of extravagance, and I mentioned a few. Um, even sporting victories, right? Because when we win our first futsal game, hey, maybe I'll go out and I'll spend a bit of money to have some ice cream with you guys. You know, I'll do something a little extravagant. Um, I think the occasion calls for it, right? So, you know, moderation, it doesn't only apply to clothing, right? There's other aspects of moderation. So, you know, we talked about, you know, dress. You know, women's makeup, you know, your makeup should be moderate. Um, your hair, you know, your physique, you know, men's physique. I mean, it's one thing to want to be slim and to be healthy, but you don't have to be like, you know, there's people that are like showing their abs off and all that sort of stuff, you know, because it's like, is, are you being moderate in how much time and, uh, and energy you're investing into your physique? Um, jewelry, you know, there's, I think there are times to wear jewelry, but, you know, be moderate about it. Uh, materialistic possessions, you know, maybe pleasures, you know, holidays. There's nothing wrong with going on a long overdue holiday, but people that are just going on these extravagant holidays once, twice a year, all the time, I think it's not a good use of your money. Uh, even on technology or on your home, right? People have these really extravagant homes, but one day, you know, it's all just going to be burnt up. It's all just going to go. <coughs> How are you spending your life and your money? So that's two. So first one is clothes that draw attention to themselves. Second is clothes that draw attention to your wealth. And the last one um, is clothes, or the lack thereof, clothes that draw attention to your body. Now, I think this can apply to guys as well, obviously, right? Like if guys sort of work out and they, if they've got big muscles and things like that, and then they specifically wear clothes that accentuate those muscles, I don't think that's being modest. But I think it more applies to women because, you know, women don't lust after men as much as men lust after women. That's just a biological fact, right? Um, if we're talking about stereotypes. So, when we think of these passages, like in 1 Timothy, what are these teaching? These, teaching? these are teaching that the adorning, the beautifying of a woman ought to be the inward man, you know, but, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So, the outward adorning the clothes that draw attention to your body, this is not how a, a woman, a Christian woman, ought to be seen as beautiful. Um, it ought to be the inward man. 
So when we think about clothes that draw attention to the body and to the sensual features of a woman, you know, your appearance should emphasize your personality. Like when, when somebody looks at you, if their first thought is, oh, you know, she's got a nice figure, she's got nice this, nice these features, that's not what you want. You want somebody to look at you and think, you know, this is a godly woman. And I'm thinking about her personality. Now, obviously, how men think about women should not be the basis for how we dress. It's just one thing that we want to consider. Because obviously, if men controlled how women dress, it, you might come across like a Muhammad, right? And then Muhammad just wants women just wearing tents all the time, <laughs> and you can't see anything. So, you know, it's, it's about taking it into consideration, you know, and, and an issue of the conscience. You know, when I dress, you know, am I trying to make men look at my breasts? You know, am I, am I purposely wearing a low cut dress? Or, you know, I've seen these dresses that have like this window right here. I mean, <laughs> If you've got a window right here, I mean, what are, you, what are you trying to get people to look at? You know, you're not trying to get people to look at your face. You know, if you have, you have a dress that has like a window right on your, on your cleavage. Um, or, or, you know, even like, uh, I, I know like a lot of women wear things where basically it really accentuates the features. Like it'll draw attention to the buttocks. It'll draw attention to the breasts and things like that. So you got to think about what you're wearing um, and you might think it's cute, but, you know, men are going to last after you and you don't, want to necessarily encourage that you know it takes it takes zero talent it takes zero intellect to, to take your clothes off so that you get attention you know what I mean like it takes zero talent and, and it takes zero intellect to wear something that is immodest so that men will pay attention to you but it takes some spirituality it takes walking in the flesh it takes some intellect and, and and some talent for men to notice you for who you are rather than just how you look um, so you know, that's why you, sometimes you see these, uh, these online personalities and they have millions and millions of subscribers, millions and millions of followers. Um, and it's just because they're, they're dressing immodestly. That doesn't take any talent. You know, any girl can start a YouTube channel topless and then get millions of subscribers. It's because they're not after what you're, they're actually going to say. You know, they're after because they want a free show. And it's the same when you dress. You know, you want people to befriend you because of what, who you are and what you have to say, not just because of how you look. Um, you know, it's like likes on Facebook photos, you know, like, like when some women, they take photos of, of themselves and put them on Facebook and say, oh, what do you think? And they like getting all the likes and the loves and the, you know, whatever. It doesn't take any talent to do that. You know what I mean? Anyone could take a photo of themselves in the bathroom and then post it and people are going to like it. You know, if you want to get an opinion of how you're dressed, you know, ask people that actually love you, you know, and they're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you like, you know, stop wearing that dress or stop wearing that shirt. It's too, it's too revealing. Um, that's how you ought to get opinions, not from your buddies on Facebook that want a free show. So we see here, you know, in, um, in this passage, the shamefacedness. That's what's referring to the clothes that don't draw attention to your body because shamefacedness means you have shame. You don't, you're, you're, you're ashamed when, at the thought of people seeing your nakedness or nearly showing it, right? Because you might say, well, I'm, I'm in this mini skirt, my nakedness is covered, but it's still suggesting it. It's still uh, pointing people towards it. Um, you ought to have that shame. What does it say in 1 Peter? Let's go to 1 Peter 3, 2. It says here, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So chaste is when you're pure. Chastity is when you're a virgin. So your clothes ought to make people think that you're chaste. You know, some people, some girls dress in a way where they may be a virgin, but when they see you dress that way, do they think you're a virgin? You know, like there are some ladies that dress in a way like that girl's probably not a virgin, you know, although she might be. So that's part of wearing chaste clothing. Um, let's go to that famous ver verse in Proverbs where it talks about here. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the street, and lieth in wait at every corner. So in Proverbs, we learn about a woman with the attire of an harlot. That means she's got clothing of a prostitute. Now, it doesn't tell us what that clothing is, but then you've got to ask yourself, you know, when I look at what I'm wearing, when I look at what this person's wearing, do they look like a prostitute? Like if I had a group of prostitutes and then I had me and my girlfriends there, 
do we look the same? Is there any differentiation between like this group? I mean, some prostitutes might dress better than some girls these days, you know, in terms of more covered up. Um, so you got to think about these things, you know. Obviously, the reason why a harlot is dressing in a certain way is because she's trying to draw attention to her features, to entice men to want to sleep with her and to pay her to want to sleep with her. So this, this lady here in Proverbs 7.10 is the opposite of what a Christian should be. She's trying to draw attention to her body. And look, she is loud and stubborn. But what ought the Christian woman to be? Not draw attention to your body. And you ought to be meek and quiet with shamefacedness and sobriety. And I'll go into this a bit more next week. But, you know, you need to consider your brothers in Christ. You know, you, you, yes, I don't think that necessarily the lusts of men ought to dictate what you wear because obviously you just wear a T-shirt. A, a guy might last after you, right? They can see anything. So, you know, should, should you just be dressed in like, you know, you have like support structures <laughs> and it's like a circle and then you just got this thing just coming down, just totally hiding everything. I mean, even then, I mean, guys will probably have thoughts because they're just thinking, oh, I bet she's flying underneath that outfit or something like that. So, you know, you're not going to control the lusts of men, but it's something that you ought to consider. You know, like a woman shouldn't have the attitude of like, well, I'm just going to wear this because I like it. I don't care what, what men think. I don't care if men lust after me. That's what I believe God does not like, that, that women ought to have the liberty to dress how they want, but then they should be governed by love. They should be governed by charity and consider how men are going to look at you and, and are they going to last after you and should you dress differently. So, you know, women, you ought to get the opinions of men around you if you're unsure. If you're unsure and say, you know, do you think my outfit is modest or not? I mean, a man that loves you, like your father or your husband, he's going to tell you. Um, or your brother that loves you. <clears throat> um, not your Facebook friends, you know. So, so keep that in mind. So I'll end it there, but those are the three principles. And I'll go into a bit more specifics next week. But one, clothing that draws attention to itself, clothing that draws attention to your wealth, and then clothing that draws attention to your body. I think those are the three areas we need to think about. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Lord, as we continue to study this topic, um, pray that you would mold and change us, that your Holy Spirit would uh, speak to us, that our consciences would convict us. And Lord, our standard of how we dress and how we use our resources and how we use our money would, would increase. And Lord, we would keep our eyes focused on you. We'd think about the things of eternity. Um, so Lord, I pray that you continue to use and mold this church. Uh, me as well, Lord. I'm not, I'm not uh, immune to the things preached today. I haven't arrived. Uh, pray, Lord, that you continue to build and uh, uh, mold us according to your will. Um, thank you, Lord. Thank you that uh, we have this church here. pray that you'd continue to lead and guide us in where we're to go from here. And we thank you. We pray you, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.